Hi, everyone. I think we're, we're about to begin. Um, thank you all for coming. Before we start, I want to give a special thanks to Career Services, um, Amy and Dawn in particular, for helping us so much with this event. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, so good evening, and welcome to the New York City Tech Talent Draft. Before we get started, I would like to point out that there are surveys and sign-up sheets right outside the door here, um, as well as informational flyers for upcoming career fairs and internship programs. <coughs> So take a look on your way out. Um, my name is Virginia Maloney. I am a project manager at the New York City Economic yes. Development Corporation, the city's primary engine for economic growth and job creation. In the past few years, we have seen New York City emerge as a booming tech hub with a deeply engaged, innovative entrepreneurial community that is rapidly attracting new VC firms and talent. For the first time ever, New York has consistently surpassed Massachusetts in terms of technology venture capital, making it second in the nation only to Silicon Valley. By our last count, New York boasts over 1,000 startups, including our panelists here today, the great homegrown <coughs> companies, as well as um, industry leaders like Google, Facebook, and Twitter. Under the leadership of our entrepreneur-in-chief, Mayor Bloomberg. We at NYC EDC are working hard to support the city's booming tech community. From an early stage seed fund to a network of incubators that provide affordable space to entrepreneurs, to the new engineering and applied science campuses we're building in Roosevelt Island with Cornell University and Technion Israel Institute of Technology, and also campuses at NYU and Columbia. To better illustrate the innovation currently being made in New York, we would like to show you a short video brought to you by New York Tech Meetup and NASDAQ. Hi, I'm Mayor Michael Bloomberg, and I'm here to pitch you on a once-in-a-lifetime business opportunity. Start my day with a game of squash with one of our investors. Jump on the ferry to head down to Dumbo where our office is. Breakfast at Peel's. That's like a four-star check-in you see every day. Breakfast meeting at Balthazar. When people visit New York, they kind of picture New Yorkers as these super rude people, but we're not. We're just busy and trying to get things done. I'm uh, giving this keynote right now at Bloomberg for Social Media Week. I went to the New York Times. I had a meeting with the R&D department and... Had a client meeting on Madison Avenue with one of the agencies. Yeah, Wall Street, Midtown, Union Square, Uptown. Brooklyn in one single day. I can do 10 meetings in a day. I can meet 10 different people in 10 different neighborhoods. It's crowded, it's dirty, it's loud, but it's all really close. We meet a lot, which is great. One of the ways we actually got to know a lot of the community in New York City, all of our early alpha beta testers, for instance, is by hanging out with them and by going to tech events, by actually participating and seeing what are cool things that they're doing. We want to be based here in New York primarily for the food. Yesterday I had a lovely lunch, work-related lunch, at the Sri Lankan place in Little India. Grey Dog. Anytime you walk into Grey Dog, there's like 15 entrepreneurs there. You might be working long hours, but there's always a 24-hour diner open to grab a cup of coffee. Our first office, we only had one bathroom. We had 40 people in there. <laughs> um, so we would often have meetings across the street at, at coffee shop. Basically knew everyone at, at all the other tables. It was a bunch of venture capitalists, a bunch of other startups, and in the lobby of the Ace Hotel. Ace Hotel, you go, the middle table inevitably has 10 people sitting there with their MacBook Airs. If you just walk by, you'll see code on nine out of 10 of those screens. One of our best engineers, we found him at a party about to do a keg stand. You go out and you meet people in San Francisco. You know, so what do you do? Oh, I'm working on a web startup. Well, what do you do at night? I'm working on a web startup. In New York, you're just like, ah, maybe I work in tech during the day, but at night I, I'm in a band, I make something. You know, I'm brewing kombucha in the kitchen. I'm actually going to the Knicks game, uh, gonna see Linsanity for myself. All sorts of different events every evening, pitching our idea. You go out to parties, you spend time out, out in New York, and it's a pretty awesome thing to run into people who are doing totally different things. This is not Silicon Valley, and yet I see a fabulous tech community here that has risen up and set example for the rest of the tech world. We could do it someplace else, but it wouldn't be like New York. The best part about being in New York is that you're not anywhere else. Your future is here in New York City the most interesting, diverse, intellectually challenging, 
and friendliest place you will ever live and work in. This is where the best and the brightest come to shine. I look forward to seeing you here. to this evening's moderator, Betsy Scherzer. Thank you. So I'm Betsy Scherzer. I am a senior project manager at EDC, and I cover a portfolio of projects that support the technology industry in New York. I'm really excited about our amazing panelists that we have here today that really do represent the diverse industries of New York City, from finance to media, healthcare, the arts, uh, big data analytics, and even software. Um, so before we get started, I just want to have everybody on our panel briefly introduce themselves. We'll dive into discussion, and I will be sure to leave plenty of time for Q&A. So we can start with you, Gabby. Hey, I'm uh, Gabby Wolf. I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of IndieWalls. Uh, I'm not sure if we're supposed to go into what we do or if we're yeah. just... Okay, so IndieWalls is, is essentially uh, first a marketplace for bringing together artists and venues like a hotel, where you can see uh, all the artwork um, for sale in that hotel, and then that, that space will redirect you to our website where you can purchase it. So essentially, we're turning that hotel lobby into a pop-up gallery by creating a marketplace to bring the two parties together, and then it's an e-commerce platform for consumers to actually purchase those pieces uh, using QR codes and URLs. I think that covers it. Cool. And I'm Pete Miron. I'm VP of Engineering at Bitly. Uh, Bitly allows you to save, share, and analyze uh, links on the social, social web, so on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, my name is uh, Deepak Chakadi. I'm the uh, VP of Engineering at Everyday Health. Um, to briefly describe Everyday Health, uh, we are an online media company. Um, in short, we want to be the ESPN of health. So anything about health, we want you to come to us. Right. Hi, um, my name is Chet McCarr. I am with Tenton Data. We are the big data. Okay. I'm also uh, a parent of uh, a Cornell student here, so it's it's a pleasure to be here. Maybe I'll see some of you down in College Town uh, tonight. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, we, we, we provide a platform for our um, customer to analyze very large sets of data. We're talking about magnitude or trillion billion uh, rows of record. Okay? That's the kind of data that we're talking about. Uh, we, our customers, they're, um, they're corporations, not, um, you know, not individuals. Um, they come and they analyze their own data. They also then are uh, able to use their own data and mash up, link up with other people's data. Um, they also uh, then sell the data too. So um, a company like Rite Aid, right? They have the point of sale onto our, um, we host that for them. But then uh, a consumer product company like uh, Procter & Gamble, they may be interested in the sales um, data from Rite Aid. So they can purchase that from Rite Aid and do things with that. So there are various ways that you can use um, Tenton data, but we're cloud-based and we host people's data. Uh, my name is Andre Moray, and I'm one of the co-founders of Octopart. Uh, Octopart is a search engine for electronic components. Uh, we aggregate data from um, manufacturers and distributors of electronic parts and make it searchable uh, so that electrical engineers from companies uh, like Tesla, General Electric, Boeing, down to small hardware startups can find the components that they need uh, to build uh, cool hardware projects. Uh, my name is Dominic Preuss. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Second Market. Uh, Second Market is trying to build an alternative to the public stock markets. Uh, public markets are fundamentally broken for many companies, especially smaller companies. So we partner with companies to create liquidity programs that allow them to trade without having to go public. Hi, my name is Yoshime Sammy. I'm the co-founder and senior partner of Intridia. 
We are a product design and development consulting firm. We specialize in web and mobile application experiences. And we work with Fortune 500 brands, venture-backed startups, to just basically help them take their dreams and make them real. So if you have an idea, we can help build it for you. And I uh, would love to talk to any of you later uh, or during the Q&A about Ruby on Rails development, HTML5, iOS, or Android development, if that's of interest to you. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. So to get to the heart of the issue, why would you recommend that techies in this audience decide to work at a startup early in their career? And what are some of the trade-offs that they should consider when deciding whether to work for a small early stage company versus perhaps a larger, more mature organization? And Dominic, I'm going to start with you, actually. Uh, you heard this answer last week at MIT. <laughs> um, so what I think is, is really interesting, so uh, I spent my career early on um, at, at startups. Uh, I came out in 99, went to a company called Trilogy. Uh, I actually worked at Google for a number of years from when it was about 1,500 people to about 22,000. So I've actually kind of seen the evolution of smaller companies up to, to larger companies. Um, and obviously, the, everyone here can talk about the upside of startups, and, and I'll let everyone talk to that, um, specifically about your ability to have impact and have ownership over specific pieces. Um, one of the things that I always like to point out to people is that, uh, like New York City, startups aren't for everybody. So uh, New York City is very binary. Either you love the energy and you feed off of it, or it crushes you. Right, those are your two options. Um, and startups are very similar as well. So startups are extremely exciting and they're incredibly uh, rewarding, but at the same time can be incredibly difficult, right? So the, the amplitude of your experience is much greater. Your highs are higher and your lows are lower. So one of the things that we always talk to people, especially before we hire them, if they don't have startup experience, um, is understanding kind of what you're signing up for. It's, uh, it's a very uh, amazing experience, but also it's very stressful. And so um, we can talk about all the good things, but it's also good to talk about kind of making sure you come in wise, eyes wide open uh, when you come to New York City or if you join a startup, because uh, it's definitely a trade-off. I can jump in, yeah. Uh, so, you know, for myself personally, when I was in a lot of your shoes, and I'd like to think that wasn't too long ago, but honestly, it's been <laughs> over 10 years now, so it was a while ago. Uh, I remember struggling with just trying to pick where to work, because there's so many amazing companies out there, and I didn't want to have to just pick one. And I, I thought that that was really daunting to, to try to come up with that one company that I may spend the next three, five, or 10 years at. Uh, and I think, you know, the beauty of a startup is that you partner with so many companies every day. And, and any startup here, you're, you're constantly looking for folks that you can connect with to grow your business or do business with. And that's the, that's the beauty of a startup. With us, our clients are Cisco, Verizon, Bank of America, Safeway, Puma. These companies are all in different industries. And we get a window into each of those companies and the things that they do. So there's just this variety that comes with being in a startup that I didn't find when I worked for a, a large corporation when I first got out of school. Uh, it was in the financial services industry, and we do a lot of work there now. Uh, but I struggled to find that variety when I was in a big company. And I think, like Dominique said, you know, a startup, if, if, if you like regiment and structure, then a startup's not for you. Uh, but if you if you like that change of pace and that variety, then I think a startup's perfect for you. And also playing off of what Yoshi was was mentioning, it's not just working with different companies, <coughs> it's also working on a variety of jobs inside of the office. So most startups don't have people who specialize in a very narrow set of skills. You kind of need to know how to do everything. The first startup I worked at, I went from programming Linux firewalls to doing advertising design for some of the, the ads that we were putting in, uh, as well as phone customer support. So you need to be prepared to, to kind of spread and, and try out lots of new things. Um, I worked, uh, I was head of IT for one of the major banks, and I was working down in South America. So I understand working in a traditional uh, kind of company versus with uh, more of a startup, a small company. Uh, if you have a new idea, right, in a big company, that needs to go through a whole committee process. Getting that idea implemented could be months. Um, whereas with a startup, you know, if you have a new idea, you can talk to a few people, people get excited with it, and you can do it right away. Now, 
the downside of it, like someone says, is you own the problem, okay? There's no one else really kind of to catch you. So you really have to be sure of what you're doing, and if you have the confidence, and if you have a drive to uh, want to get it done, it's a great pay place to be at. But if you really need like a big committee people to help you out and guide you, okay, um, startup is not what you uh, want to be. And so, great. So, so just okay. wanted to add one more thing. I think for um, for the hackers, um, for people studying computer science. You want to think about what are the problems that you like to work on. If you like to work on pure technology problems, like if you want to do AI, if that's what's going to make you happy, it's going to be hard to find a successful startup where you're going to get to like focus on AI. If you just like to build stuff and you like to build stuff as quickly as possible, then a startup uh, could be perfect. So that was actually an excellent segue to my next question. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have planned it better. Um, we all know that Cornell students are know, up for lots of challenges. I was hoping you guys could talk about some of the really interesting technical problems that your developer teams has have faced. Um, maybe I will start with you, Gavi, since you haven't spoken up yet. Yeah, so uh, I think <laughs> we're kind of a hard company to pick for uh, for that type of problem. Um, we're, we're, we're definitely a tech company, but we're definitely lighter on the tech. Um, and some of the other companies. I think for this question, I will definitely answer the next one, but I think I should throw it over to somebody else. <laughs> um, I, can take a, I can take an example. So, you know, with the uh, uh, mobile devices coming in and the integration that you have between websites and mobile devices, so one of the challenges that we continue to work with is how to seamlessly create an experience for the user between web and mobile without really breaking the experience. Um, so, you know, I do something on the web that needs to be up on the cloud somewhere that is available for mobile, being able to switch between the different channels at the same time. So that's a classic example of something that we, you know, struggle with, find different ways, test, and, you know, trial and error, we try different things. <coughs> some things work, some things don't work. And this is a, a good example of something that, you know, we could use as, uh, as, you know, as an example of um, uh, the technical challenges here. Yeah, I also I can give also a good example that also might give you an idea of um, how how startups sort of make trade offs in, in in technology like the, the the choices that you have to make. So what we so we're a search engine and we have about twenty million parts in our database. And what we found is that um, typically you'll have you'll store your data in in a database and you'll use like a separate system for for search. And so we use Solar and we have we store data in MySQL. And we found that we uh, ended up with this impedance mismatch where we had a ton of data in one place and in one schema, and then a ton of data in another place, another schema. And any time we wanted to change the schema and reindex stuff, it would take you know take a couple of days. It was really slowing us down. And that worked for a while. And then we reached a point where that um, it, we couldn't let it slow us down anymore. So we took a step back and actually built a system that um, uh, a search system with a very flexible schema. So we basically got rid of the impedance mismatch and built a search engine where we can update the schema on the fly and, and basically makes it really we can reindex things on the fly, so we don't have to take the the site down or anything. Um, now, what I want to do is dive into that system and make it extremely fast and and add all these features, but Right now, it's not necessary for us to do that, so that's where we're holding back. But anyway, that, that's one of the, the, my favorite problems that we've worked on. And, and for, for us at Bitly, we actually have two kind of sets of problems. One is, Bitly started out as a piece of internet infrastructure, so it had to work really reliably and really quickly. And over the last four years, Bitly has done a really good job of doing that. And now we're switching into more of a web product development mode where we're building sites for users, trying to figure out exactly how they want to use that site, what information they need. And we're going through much quicker iteration on that. So we're moving more from that being that solid infrastructure to learning how to develop products quickly. Uh, and along with that, we also have a lot of uh, big data problems where through all the data that we're generating, uh, through the clicks that come through Bitly, uh, we're looking at trying to find new and interesting ways to give our enterprise users insights about who their audience who their audience is. Maybe you should use Tenton Ten data. We could. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing it out there. <laughs> um, we're very much uh, business driven. I think uh, one of the things that we try not to do is to be too in love with technology. We really view technology as a tool to help us solve uh, business problems. So uh, for a long time, people want to um, look at data, not just their own data. They want to take their data, link it up, mash it up with some other 
um, sets of data. And traditional database, right, the only way to do that is you define your tables and how they're going to be linked up and which fields you're going to be linking it with. Uh, we took that away, okay? So, uh, so you could take one, uh, one uh, data set from one company, your own company. You can link it to another public, company, uh, public data, like weather, right? You have, we have temperature, we have, the we uh, we have you know, whether it's sunny or whatever. If you have a view that your sale of particular product, right, could go up or down because of weather, we allow you to just dynamically link them together and do your analysis with that. Great. So I also want to ask our panelists, what are the qualities that you guys are looking for when hiring students, and what can students as applicants do to stand out in your minds? I'll, uh, I'll jump in on this one first this time. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think for us, uh, it, I, just, I just graduated from Cornell uh, last year. Um, so I'm pretty new at, at, at what I'm doing, and I, I'm pretty recently in kind of a similar space to a lot of seniors. Um, and I think, you know, for us, I think a lot of people said that what they would have wanted is, to some extent, to show a lot of interest. I think something, all the people that we've hired um, that have worked with us, have kind of come up with how they could really fit in. I think specifically with startups that are really, really startups like us, we're, we're four people strong, um, you know, we're growing really quickly right now, but we're still really in the early stage. And if somebody can come to us and say, this is how I can really provide value, unless it's, unless it's somebody who, who we already know exactly what they're gonna be doing, if you can say, this is, this is how I think I can get involved, and it's something that already solves kind of a problem we're looking at, um, and if you can kind of get your head into the same space as we are, that's something which separates you super fast, um, giving us an idea and already a way that you can roll it out. Even if we don't end up implementing that idea, yeah. it's, it's an incredible way to, to get us to pay a lot of attention to what you're talking about. Yeah, I, so to add on a little bit to what Gabi was saying, really finding somebody to reach out to inside any one of the companies that you want to target and showing that level of interest is going to put you well above where most other students applying are going to be. So understanding the product, knowing what they have to offer, and then also reaching out and trying to get more information about the problems that you know, any of us are facing or any similar com companies are facing will put you well in front of most other students. Um, one of the most interesting challenges that we have in going through and, and speaking to specifically on the software engineering side is um, we're very much a company of pragmatists. Um, for the you computer science people out there, um, if you want to read a really good book about the real world, there's a book called The Pragmatic Programmer. I recommend that everybody reads it. And for us, as we're going through a resume and we're talking to people, um, and I've had this conversation actually with multiple people today, is that the thing that we always look for is people that actually take from beginning to end projects. So starting, you know, we'll say, what have you actually taken from beginning to end? Because we're looking for doers. One of the big challenges, too, in computer science is that there's this tension between the elegant, perfect solution and the practical solution that actually creates the business value. And so for us, we're always looking for people that understand that, yes, this might not be the most elegant solution, but it's the right solution for the problem, for the time frame, you know, without burning a bunch of time. So we are specifically very targeted at doers and, and pragmatists. And so um, to that end, having projects that you've done beginning to end, having a project on the side, you know, whatever, you know, website for your club or starting a club or doing anything where you've actually started it and finished it, that's something that's always really powerful for us on a resume to kind of differentiate, you know, those types of people. I just want to just agree with that. I think <laughs> that that's like a really important thing. We, we always want to see specifically with developers that they've done something completely on their own because when you're young, you just need somebody who, who can just jump in and, and take care of it themselves and you don't have to baby them. So I think really, really good point. Yeah, and just to add to that, to give you sort of a toolbox for when you are applying for a job or looking to talk to a company, if you have a portfolio, if say you're on the user experience side and you've done some design work, please include that you know, in an email. Or if you're a developer, we love to see a GitHub account. If you have open source projects, big plus, right? Because it gives us a window into the kinds of projects that you choose to commit your time to uh, and also lets us get sort of a picture at how you code, right? Uh, hackathons, if you've participated in them, let us know. Uh, and then even social media, right? I mean, it, it is relevant and important too. So a LinkedIn profile, if you have a presence on Twitter, that doesn't hurt either. Uh, and then the other thing I'd add is 
you know, I think in kindergarten and, and in college, we're, we're taught to sort of paint between the lines and to wait in line, right, and follow the rules, and that's good. So if you see, and, and I think in the material that's been sent out to the group, there are job links to the career page on all of our respective websites. If you see a job posting, definitely apply there, but then also, as Peter said, you know, identify the VP of engineering or the VP of design or the VP of mobile or what have you, uh, or even just, you know, a, a software developer, someone more junior that may be closer to you in experience, and, and reach out to them as well. So, you know, think outside the box, ask them questions, and then they'll help percolate your resume up to the people that are making decisions for recruiting. Do you guys also have any blogs or meetups in particular that you would recommend students might want to follow or, or join? Yeah, Hacker News. Mashable. Definitely. Don't read the comments in Hacker News, though. Yeah, just skip the comments. Call the links, <laughs> ignore yeah. most of the comments. At least nothing past the third comment down. <laughs> I like Fred Wilson's blog a lot. Yeah. I forget what it's called. ABC. 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 Yeah, there we go. ABC. ABC. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot that. Mark Schuster, both sides of the table. It's good. Venture Beat. Paul Graham's essays. Yes, Paul Graham. Paul Graham's great. Joel on software is probably the other. Great. 37 signals. <laughs> They've got a good one. So turning the conversation back to New York City, you know, you guys have all decided to come to New York to, in many cases, start companies or join companies in New York City. You know, what for you is the best part about living and working in New York City? And also, what are some of the very real challenges that I know you have all faced? That's a load of questions. <laughs> I will call on someone if nobody jumps <laughs> yeah, in. Gabby, <laughs> my favorite person to call. <laughs> we, uh, we're we're a, like a hyper New York company because all of our, I mean, we're pairing with venues only in Manhattan right now. So it kind of forced us to be in New York. But uh, but I'd say we love New York because it, it is a really good space for tech also. Like even though we didn't even start out thinking so much about the tech community, but it's, you know, we work in WeWork, which is uh, we work in WeWork. Um, which is like a, a communal workspace. It's, it's awesome. We're surrounded by really, really interesting, cool people. We just finished Dream It, which is an incubator, and we only got into that because we were in the space in New York. And I think the video did a pretty good job of being true to what New York is. It's just a, a great way to constantly meet people. I also go to like six meetings in a day, and I can actually do them all back to back. Because, and, I'm, and they're not in my office. They're in other people's offices. Um, one of the downsides is just New York can sometimes be really gross and dingy and is nothing like Cornell. And I, I really like Ithaca. <laughs> <laughs> and that sucks a lot because you can't mountain bike in, in, in New York City. Yeah, usually running water isn't clean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't drink yeah. from the water on the street. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, okay. Uh, I live in, um, work in New York now, and I would say the biggest change of living in New York is when I'm sp sp uh, standing and my window, I can actually see someone else's 60-inch flat-screen TV playing <laughs> across the street. And I just wanted to have one of those global remote and just turn to my channel because it's just beautiful. But um, it's great living and, and working in New York City. And uh, the kind of talent that we can attract, uh, it's just amazing. I mean, we have, I mean, when you say we're in New York, would you like to come and work in New York? You know, it's not like we really have to do that much uh, convincing. Um, our founders, they're all ex-Wall uh, Street IT executives, so it, it was very natural for them to start the business in New York, but um, over time, as a company has grown, uh, for us to attract the right talent to come into New York, um, you know, it's, it's been great. Um, now, the downside really is the cost, right? The office space, I mean, it's just... Taxes. Uh, taxes, yes. Well, they're not any be they're not any worse in California, so. That's true. <laughs> there are some taxes in New York that you don't have to pay in California. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, San Francisco is a great um, startup hub. It's the best startup hub, um, and New York is um, an amazing hub for entrepreneurialism. Like everywhere you look, there are entrepreneurs. Like the guy, the hot dog stand, that's an entrepreneur. Um, the restaurants, uh, the restaurant tours. Um, we, our office is a block from Shake Shack, which is like, which is our model for an incredible business. Like, 
Shake Shack, if you guys don't know, is a uh, hamburger stand that is, uh, that's had a two-hour-long line in front of it since it since the date opened. Anyway, so I think that in New York, like you just get like you just get influenced and inspired by um, entrepreneurs that are completely outside of your industry. And um, I can't really think of any other city where where you can find that. Yeah, and just to um, give a little historical context, because I think there, there's some misconceptions about New York still. So um, I spent the last eight years uh, of my career not moving to California, and um, the. I've actually left multiple jobs because the next step for me in that job was to move to California. And the reason that I did that is that my lifestyle and what I wanted in my life was more important than those career decisions at that point. So if you're a young person and you want to have that type of social life, you have to be in New York. Now that used to have a tax. There used to be a career tax if you wanted to be in tech and be in New York City. And that was definitely true about eight years ago. And over the last eight years, the, I think the most incredible thing that I've seen is the fact that that tax has gone away and that every opportunity that you could ever want in technology that used to really only be available in California is now available in New York. And you can do anything. There's an, you know, as much venture capital as you could possibly imagine. There's as much infrastructure you can possibly imagine. Um, but one of the anecdotes that I use all the time, and I think this is something that applies to young people, and as I get older uh, and closer to, um, you know, I'm getting married in the spring and having children, so my perspective on this is changing. But as I was growing up, one of my favorite venture capital statements, and this wasn't about New York at the time, was that a venture capital said, I love funding companies that are in Palo Alto. And the reason is, is that I love giving them my money because I know that the only thing they're doing with my money is building my startup. If they're not building their startup, then they're sleeping because there's nothing else to do. And so, you know, I think that that was very much encapsulates the, the, the kind of trade-offs that you have to make. Like, every decision in life is, is a set of trade-offs, especially in New York City, especially around real estate. But the, there are the, you have to understand what the trade-offs are. And as a young person, like, I can't imagine any better place to be than New York City for any job. And now I can say that you can do tech there without any cost to your career, any, losing any kind of uh, optionality. The, the, the last thing I'd add to this is... The only thing that, that you guys haven't all covered is the fact that in New York, it is a spread of different business segments. I mean, we've got everything up here from healthcare to electronics to uh, data and software platforms, which you don't tend to find in a lot of the other, uh, other tech hubs. So everything from advertising and media and publishing uh, is right in New York in a way that it's not uh, on the West Coast. It's also very humbling because no matter how good you are, there's other people that are better than you in other industries. So true. Great. So I just want to see your show of hands. How many of you guys in the audience are actually interested in becoming entrepreneurs yourselves, founders? Okay, awesome. So one great way to learn how to start a company is to obviously work for a startup. But I know we have a few panelists who had experience with incubators and accelerators. I thought I would just touch upon that. Andre, can I call on you first? Sure. So we did Y Combinator in 2007. So we were in the third batch, um, and it was—I mean—it was an amazing experience. Uh, my um, co-founder and I, um, actually, so three of us were in grad school, physics grad school, and uh, we, after we raised money from Y Combinator, we dropped out of grad school uh, to focus on the company and. Um, and I, I'm not sure if we would have done that had we not gone through Y Combinator. Um, anyway, if there are any particular questions about uh, YC or incubators in general, I'd love to answer them. You can talk about Dream It. I don't know if you. Uh, we just, yeah, we just had a spin out. Uh, so, in addition to the consulting work we do for our clients, our own team has a lot of ideas, so we'll spin out product ideas. Uh, it's called DivShot. It just was accepted into the LA launch pad. And uh, I mean, it's, it's just been two weeks that um, we've been oriented into that program. And literally in the first day of launching within that program, we had 5,000 signups for the private beta. I mean, it's pretty cool for one day and the trend has continued. So yeah, the, there's a lot of different incubators. Now in New York, You've got tech stars, you've got stuff that RRE is doing, ER, right, and an ERA. entrepreneur's round table. So there's all sorts of amazing incubators. And then you've got the NYC EDC, the, the Economic Development Corp, that brought all of us here. They've got hackathons, you've got uh, competitions for companies to move to New York. I think there's a $250,000 
cash prize for companies to move to New York? I mean, to Lower Manhattan. I mean, <laughs> so yeah, if you've got an idea, apply to it. <laughs> yeah, if, if you have an idea, New York's a good place to go submit it to an incubator. Yeah, is anyone else here a Techstars mentor, Peter? Have you yeah. gotten involved? Yeah, so um, just so you know, the, in terms of the incubator, the main one in New York is called Techstars, New York City, NYC. It's the New York chapter of Techstars. There's one in Boulder, in Seattle, and no, Boston, anywhere. Other Boston, places, Seattle, places other than New York. Um, <laughs> but it, there's an un incredible network of mentors that there's about 150 of us that get involved and meet with uh, startups. And so, you know, if you are looking for a little bit of a push to get you down there, Techstars New York is fantastic. Um, and we're, I think it was a really important development for the New York City um, startup uh, kind of uh, ecosystem. And even beyond just the incubators, uh, there's also a lot of the, the early, like first round, uh, a lot of these early seed stage uh, investors are building up enough of a network now where you can learn and get mentors just through those seed stage investments. I know Y Combinator is a great network of like yeah, that. absolutely. I think uh, the best um, part of Y Combinator is just the alumni network. Um, at this point, they've funded 400 companies. I'm not even sure how many founders are, uh, are in that, on that list, maybe 900 founders. Um, and uh, that's an incredible network to be a part of. Yeah. All right. Oh, go ahead, Gum. No, I mean, I, I, yeah, I was just part of Dream It. We just finished up Dream It. I, yeah, I would agree. It's, it's a really great program. I mean, I guess you could, you could ask this question. Tim, who uh, is also here, he just... He just finished up as well. Uh, so he was in our graduating class. If you have any questions about Dream It as well, you can direct them to him. So I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A, but just to wrap up, can everybody go down the line and just in one sentence sum up the best advice that you received, um, you know, perhaps early in your career or as a student that you would like to pass along to this wonderful audience today? <laughs> And Yoshi, I'm going to start on your <laughs> end. I mean, honestly, with the theme of today's event, one of my biggest regrets in my career is that I didn't move to New York sooner. So actually, my wife's in the room. She's back there. Uh, and we've, we moved to New York. Jada, you want to wave? <laughs> She's a patent attorney. Uh, we, we moved to New York about two years ago. And uh, we should have done it 10 years ago. So, and people had told me all along, you should be in New York, you should be in New York. And finally we did it, but I kind of wish I had done it sooner. So move to New York. Um, surround yourself with people much smarter than yourself and don't be afraid to ask a lot of questions. Um, so we started working at the company when I was 26. And sometimes I think about what would have happened, how far along we would be if we started working at the company as soon as I graduated from college. And so I, what I would say is, once you know what you want, just go all in um, and do it as soon as possible. Um, I think the founders of Tenton Data, what they really believe in is just really surrounding yourself with smart people um, and let them do what they have to do instead of micromanage them. Um, and that's, that has gone a long way for me. So um, as I rise through the corporation, I have found that to be true. If I surround myself with very smart people, I don't have as much to worry about. Uh, I don't have to spend the time to manage them and to tell them what to do every step of the way. Um, so that's, I think that's one that has gone a long way for me. Um, the thing that has helped me is to believe that any experience that you're getting is a learning experience. Um, nothing is bad. You always learn on a daily basis, yearly basis. You know, learn from what you do, learn from what you know the smart people around you are doing, um, and take it as as uh, something that you believe in, and you know, live your passion. That's that's what has helped me to to achieve success. Uh, the only thing I'd add is. Uh don't be afraid to break things. So whether you end up at a startup or a big company, like just make sure that what you're doing is changing things in such a way you're going to break some stuff. You'll learn more from that than you'll learn from anything that you ever get right. Um, you know, I think we experienced this pretty recently. And, I, you know, like I've been saying all along, we have kind of younger uh, tech, ex tech uh, experience right now just because we're, we're pretty young. But what we really found is when you're just starting out, it's, it's super important not to get stuck in in what you're doing and, and not really seeing kind of the forest from the trees um you know we we had kind of gotten stuck for a little while and uh and didn't see the bigger picture and we needed somebody one of our advisors from dream it to be like 
you guys are you guys are being in a little bit of self denial. Um, and I think that was really really helpful. Uh, and I think it's really important for young companies to recognize that some of the time, if you're kind of think you're seeing a problem, you should pay attention to that. Don't don't ignore it just because you kind of have this vision of exactly where to go. Can I just add one more? I know I had my two sentences. Okay. <laughs> um, for for me personally is take a chance. Really, just take a chance. Uh, there have been so many things I've done in my life that I would have thought I would, I would never do, like go down to Mexico City and work there for two years. I, <laughs> if you asked me 10 years ago, I've never done it. But it was good experience. I learned a lot from it. So you know, at your age, just take a chance on something. You could learn a lot from it. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. OK, I want to open up the floor to Q&A. And you, over here. I'm All right, so this one's mainly oriented toward you, Dominic. My name's Seth, by the way. You mentioned that if you're going to sign up for a startup, be sure you know what you're signing up for. And you guys kind of hinted at it being like a lot of work, but you, you said it in like, a, like a, a way where you kind of were hiding what you mean by that. Like, what do you mean when you say, be sure you know what you sign up for? Is it? Um, one of the things that uh, is amazing about a startup is that um, in one moment, you can be incredibly elated, and an hour later, you could think the world's ending. And it literally is, that's like, that's a day in the life of a startup. So true. And, you know, it's, if you, if you have a personality, like I have lots of people that I've, I've, I've managed and hired and fired people because they just can't handle that. And some people just need a little bit more regular way through life. And that's fine. Right again. I, there are lots of people who hate New York City, and I understand that it's it's not for everybody. So just when you go into it, you have to understand that like it's not the easy choice, right? And I keep telling people too, like also, you have an incredibly higher probability of making a lot more money not at startups than you do at larger companies, right? We are all doing this not because we think we're going to get rich. It's just because we have been forced into this lifestyle because we can't do anything else. <laughs> right? And so just make sure that you understand that. And like I have buddies at Google who want to leave and they're like, but the money's just not as good. And I'm like, the money is never going to be as good. You leave because you have to leave, right? And so, you know, I eventually couldn't be at Google anymore because my style and what I wanted, I couldn't have there. And so, believe me, I really wish I could work at a big bank and like be happy every day just like coming to work and doing my job and going home and unfortunately I can't. So now my fiance has to listen to me bitch every day about like all the amazing things that happen and all the terrible things that happen. And like, you know, it's not like, hey, I just had a day. It's like, here's the 10 million things that happened to me today. And like, you just have to, the, Peter's laughing because he knows exactly what I'm talking about and everyone up here is. And our significant others pay the price, which is why my fiance is a lawyer uh, as well, because she has a nice, like, easy job. Not easy, but like, <laughs> this is on tape. This is, <laughs> this is fully acknowledged. She works really hard, but like at the same time, like the world doesn't fall in on her quite as much as it does not. So my only thing is to, to people is that you have to understand that like it's a choice, and like when you get in there and you're like, I can't believe I chose to work at this crazy company. Like that's just part of the choice. Right? And like, there will be days in there and you're like, this is the worst decision I've ever made in my life. And there are other days you'll be like, this is the greatest thing ever. Right? And like, literally, the, it can change from one to the other in 30 minutes. Like, I literally, from meeting to meeting, I can be like, we are going to crush it. And the next day I'm like, we're going out of business. <laughs> like, holy crap. You know, so it's, um, you just have to understand that. And like, it, just like with everything, it's, it's, um, it's a choice. And like, it's not for everyone. And like, I have lots of friends that work in law firms and are doctors and are bankers and like they love their lives. And like that's not for me and that's not the choice I made. But like everyone has to make that choice. All right, next question. There's, a, sorry, there's just a recent oh. example where we had sorry. somebody who joined in on Monday and by Friday freaked out and left. You know, it does, it does happen. <laughs> totally. But, yeah. but you should take a chance. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we won't hold it against you. It's okay. fine in your resume. Uh, you over here. All right, uh, what's the hardest part you know, from Starting from concept, uh, idea, and having nothing. So, you know, having a concept at the end of it and really picking up. What was the hardest part of just like really starting and finding your path? I think, I don't know if it's Fred Wilson or maybe Chris Dixon. Somebody has a great 
Somebody had a great quote about the hardest part of any startup is getting people to care about your startup. Like nobody gives a shit about what you're building and getting people to care and start seeing improvements as a result of getting that feedback from those users is the absolute hardest part of building any startup. And not losing confidence until that happens. Right? Yeah, I think what you're saying is validation, right? Yeah. You can have a great idea, but until somebody actually say, here's my money, okay? It's just a concept. Okay, so, um, and you go through that, okay, it's, are people going to buy into that idea? All right, pink shirt in the back. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so I don't know your name. How critical is it that, that when you first start out, you know, with a startup, that the founding members all work together at the same time in the same place, as opposed to doing it from, you know, different places? And kind of just going like that, you know, internet chat type of deal. I can, um, I'll take a stab at that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I started with 1010 um, 12 years ago uh, as a five people uh, company. Um, we did work, all work from home because we couldn't afford to have an office. Um, and it was fine uh, in the beginning because we were in the development stage. But once the development was done, we really needed to get together and really work together. And we actually <coughs> went to one of the founders' apartment in New York City, because again, we couldn't afford um, office space. But did you guys go in the same city that you, know, you met up once in a while, or did you just pretty yes. much all, okay. we, we, we did that, uh, because we actually, our code had to be integrated. When, uh, when we started, we, uh, we, I, I, we launched in November, and I actually decided to go to a different country for five months right after we launched which was not a good idea. Um, <laughs> but for other reasons, I decided to do it, kind of life reasons instead of job reasons. But we, it was okay in the end because I knew I was coming back in five months, and we, you know, we kind of pulled through those five months, and we, we kind of made it happen, and I, I was like just working a lot in the middle of the night and sleeping during the day. Um, but it was definitely, like it, it slowed us down a lot. Like we, for those five months, we launched, and then for five months, we kind of just chugged along kind of slowly, and then when I got back, it, it really changed. So I, in, in personal experience, it made a huge difference that I was there in person. That was, that was really, really beneficial. Okay, so I'm gonna take two questions at once. My MongoDB shirt and a guy in the maroon. Um, it's better. How do you handle, uh, how do you use the good handling feeling like student loans? <laughs> Realistic question, and, and I'm going to take yours too at the same time. So answer. yeah, I think mine's similar to that, but just from the um, uh, entrepreneur's perspective, how do you encourage you know uh, students to come and join you in a city like New York, where everything's obviously uh, you know more expensive, and students have their student loans to worry about, and uh, you know the pay, I guess, for them is not so attractive as all the other professions that the city offers. Yeah, I mean, I think we all probably offer market-based salaries. Like, so more than enough to live on. You will make a good living as a software engineer, even at a startup. Unless, you know, it, it, that may change if you're bootstrapping your own startup and founding your own. But I think for, for most of the companies here, I'm sure we probably pay a, a well above a living wage for New York City. I think the difference when we're talking about you could earn a lot more money is if you look at what any of us are going to pay you versus what Goldman will pay you plus what your bonus will be at a Goldman or other large investment bank, there's a big disparity in that total comp. I think one of the cool things about New York is that um, you can live an interesting life for very little money. Uh, I've been poor in San Francisco and poor in New York, and being poor in New York uh, was a lot more interesting. <laughs> you can move to Queens or Brooklyn. That helps. Or okay. you can live at home. Really? It's always an option. You over here? <laughs> People always say, as it was mentioned here, that the highs are really high and the lows are really low, so even if you're at a start. Can you talk about the highest high you've had and if you're comfortable sharing the lowest low? <laughs> Uh, wow. I, I, uh, I worked for a company that IPO'd, uh, so became a $1.2 billion company, and then a couple weeks later was sued by another major telecom, uh, and all of that value evaporated to, I think, we, I think we paid about $200 million in IP litigation over like one six-month period, uh, which made me uh, a near professional deponent for a long period of time for those of us in patent law. <laughs>
Can anybody top that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've got the I've got the IPO, and probably my worst day was when I had to lay off my entire team. I laid off twelve people in a day. Those are the worst. All right. Next question. Anyone? Okay, you over here. Brilliant idea versus a brilliant management team. Uh, what does investors first look at? So, a brilliant idea versus a brilliant management team. What are investors and other partners looking for? Yeah, any. Um, I do a lot of angel investing as well. I shouldn't say a lot. I do some angel investing. Um, it's you're always looking for the match between a team and an area. You never look at an idea because the idea that somebody tells you they're going to do is never what they actually do. So you're always looking at the quality of the team and the area that they're in. You're not looking at the actual idea because it's always wrong. <laughs> it's always wrong. Any other questions? OK, in the, the back over there. Yeah. Hi, guys. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm a second year MBA here at Johnson. And I wanted to ask uh, about opportunities for MBA students um, in startups in New York City. Um, where do you see us succeeding? Are there opportunities? So, um, within let's say uh, everyday health, for example, you know we do have uh, you know, biz dev positions, we do have finance. So, I mean, for whatever is needed for keeping the company running and you know modeling, let's say an acquisition or modeling a new venture that you want to do, there's always need for people who can actually create these these things. So, definitely, there is opportunities that way. Um, again, I think it might vary from company to company, depending on the size that you're in and the and the domain that you're trying to to accomplish. Um, but again, you just have to explore out what is available, you know, networking and finding out what actually happens within the company. That'd be the best way to find out. Yeah, we just recently hired uh, an MBA student. Uh, she was working in an insurance company where she just allowed to do certain reports. Every day she was doing that. Um, her job at Tenton Data now is really keeping track of all, um, all of our finance. You know, how many people we have, how much we're building, what's our revenue coming in, and various time tracking and so forth. Uh, and we do find as we mature, we need better and better um, um, reporting to our, um, you know, board members, right? And to our investors, they want to make sure that we are uh, actually bringing that revenue in, our expense and so forth. OK, over here. Can you comment on some of the experiences you had not working at a startup that have best prepared you for working in a startup? Good question. Yes. I, I'll take that one because I just came back. Um, I worked, I started with 1010 uh, um, 12 years ago. I was part of the five-member team. Um, I was one of those people that couldn't hack it. I left, OK? I went uh, back. I actually went back to work in a big uh, investment bank, heading up their um, technology. Um, did the whole thing about, you know, when you want to put in a new server, what does it cost, how long it takes, and so forth. Uh, what it prepared me for is really coming back to 1010. Now it's at a point at the maturity where we do need to be more careful, of, even if we want to be agile, right? There needs to be a certain process and certain structure in place to make sure that we are spending money properly. We are, you know, doing the right type of R&D and so forth. So my experience from a big company actually prepared me and I think, you know, make me appreciate uh, what 1010 is. And the process that, uh, that I'm bringing back, hopefully it's not too much, will kind of guide the company into a more mature stage. OK, last question. You over here. Um, for those of you who have been poor in New York City, what kind of things will you do to get by? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, actually poor, though. I can answer this question. <laughs> I work for the city. Yeah, hop up in the <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I actually, I, I live with my mom. Like, it saves me lots of money right now. Um, I'm getting married, actually, in, in a month, uh, and so then I'm going to move out. <laughs> she, she recommended that I stay. I said no. Um, but, but I did that, and I, I made a lot of food for myself. Um, and essentially, my only expense was commuting into the city. Like, I just got bus passes, and 
My mom also makes me lots of food, so that saves me lots of cash. Okay, and if you don't have a mom, and <laughs> um, there's, there's housing solutions. You know, you can you live with you live with friends. Hopefully, you have friends that get paid more than you do. You know, so they stock the fridge. Um, there's lots of strategies. I mean, what's great about New York is that you can go out very cheaply. You know, there are lots of places to go out that are cheap to get drinks and to go out and you know go to comedy clubs and you know you can literally. You, you can hang out in the city and not spend a dime and be completely entertained by just talking to the homeless people. I mean, there's like, there's, there's an amazing number of things that you can do in New York City. Um, my little brother lived in the city. He interned in the city, was making nothing, and like, you know, he managed to have a fantastic summer. Um, but they're, the number one expense in the city is by far real estate. And the worst thing about New York City is real estate, not commercial real estate, but personal. Like the only thing that will give me an anxiety attack is the thought of having to find an apartment and deal with a broker and like all the BS that you have to do with in New York City. It is the only thing that I hate about New York City. And it's also your biggest expense. And so that's the one thing you really have to figure out how to manage, whether it be with roommates or you know, li not living in a hostel, that's not a good option, that's expensive. Um, <laughs> but actually, like, there, there are lots of things you can do. And there, there's so many places you can live in the city that you can find something that'll work for you. You can't live alone, but you can find places. And on the entertainment side, I can tell you there's, like, amazing free concerts, free museums, there's, like, art on the sidewalk all the time. You can get rush theater tickets. There's a lot of ways to save money. I can talk to you about them <laughs> you, <laughs> during if you, dinner. If you get into, like, a like an incubator also like they dream, dream it gave us the opportunity to live in like the NYU dorms um, so I think sometimes especially for startups there are different types of opportunities to maybe partner with you know a university to get much cheaper housing than you would get anywhere else so I don't know about so many of those things but there are things you should look into about there are a lot of schools that have cheap dorms that might be interested in, in housing people who are doing startups because New York likes startups yeah, and, and just so you know, half the city is poor, too, right? Like, not everyone is working on Wall Street. Like, there's a lot of people that start making money, and they all, everyone manages. Okay, so with that somewhat optimistic conclusion, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to just thank all of our panelists again. Big round of applause. We're going to have dinner and networking back upstairs where the career fair was, but first we are going to do like two minutes of very quick announcements all about really cool programs that are partners of the city in some way and will help you save money and start up companies and all these great things. So Virginia, take it away. Great. Um, first, the one cool organization we encourage you to all check out is Hack NY. Um, there's a hackathon this weekend, but might be a little too soon for you guys to make it to New York. But they also have um, internship programs, and there's um, uh, NYC Uncubed has a career fair on November 1st, um, not just focused on tech startups. Uh, they also feature other startups generally. Um, General Assembly has a career fair on November 10th. There are additional information packets outside about courses that General Assembly offers, um, as well as an uncubed one-pager for more information. Um, also, NYC Turing Fellows Program helps match up promising students with internship programs, and you can ask Pete more about it at the networking session. And finally, uh, NYC EDC has a program for international students with business ideas. Uh, we encourage you to apply um, for an all-expense paid trip to New York, um, opportunities to network, as well as some funding. And here are some helpful links. We will be sending out this PowerPoint. Um, if, if you've signed up on the sign-in sheet outside, which we encourage you all to do, um, and encourage you to look at these links. And that's everything. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.